uh, Isaiah 52 and 53, why so much emphasis on the dark things, the difficult things that happened to Jesus? Maggie said, because we would, those are the things we would not expect, we would to, not expect to hear uh, about our Savior. Yeah, those of you who know about Islam, you know that um, they reverence Jesus. Uh, Muslims reverence Jesus very much. Uh, in fact, I, you see people named Isa. That's the name. That's Jesus' name in Arabic. Um, they believe he was born of a virgin. They believe he's coming back to judge the living and the dead. They believe he was sinless. All, all of that. But this cross stuff, no. They do not believe that. They say this is impossible. God would never allow his prophet to go through this kind of difficulty. And that's, if God is powerful, why would he? Why would he? So there's the startling aspect and uh, the shocking aspect, and uh, Isaiah helps us get our heads around that. But why does Jesus go through all of this? Why does the Messiah of Isaiah go through all of this terrible stuff? To pay for our sins. Okay. Just to pay the price. To pay the price, to pay for our sins. He, he dies because of our sins, literally, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, literally, it's because of our sins. Because our sins, if we were there, oh, I'd like to think that I'd be among those who followed him and was really, you know, really on his side. The crowd was on his side when he came in. But a week later, they were not on his side. Statistically speaking, that's a difficult thing to think about for ourselves, that maybe we wouldn't be as welcoming if we didn't know the truth about him, for instance. Our sin put him there, and literally our sin put him there, because he paid the price for our sins. We're going to see this towards the end of 53 When you look at 53 towards the end, we see that it's actually the will of the Lord to bruise him. You see 53.10. Would somebody read 53.10 and uh, 11? But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Verse 11, as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Okay. And then going down to the end of 12, he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. He was numbered with the transgressors. Uh, There are several ways we could see that. There were three crosses there. He was the middle cross. He was actually numbered. He was number two, uh, numbered with the transgressors there. For he who had no sin was made to be sin. That's where I was going to go next, from 2 Corinthians about chapter 5. He who had no sin was made to be sin that we might become the righteousness of God. There was a transfer that happened. He gave us his legal standing and we gave him our legal standing. What was our legal standing because of our sin? Death. 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 <laughs> Death is the right word. Guilt is true too. But we were, we were dead men, dead women walking. That was the standard. That's the standing we had before the Lord. Because any time that we sin in a high-handed way, any time that we sin uh, in a way that where we are definitely going against God, in the Old Testament, the penalty is death. It's interesting, the sacrificial system, you've probably heard me say this before, but it's worth repeating. Sacrificial system gave uh, a way out of penalty for those who sin unintentionally. (laughs) That's in the scripture. 
It's for the unintentional sins, for the sins of, oh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know uh, that I was doing that. But for the high-handed ones, penalty is much more severe. So, yes, Alice. So, as I was reading Isaiah this time, and it's so, you know, blatant, why, why did the people who called him son of David, who did not recognize that this was going to happen to him, why was this a shock to them? Right. Well, let's, let's put it in context a little bit. Mm-hmm. He told Peter uh, this. He told James and John this. And how did they handle it? Even though he was instructing them for three years. Mm-hmm. They didn't handle it well. Uh, it's, not, it's not easy to go through something difficult. That's part of it. In a follow-up on what Alice said, and I was enjoying this lemon, delicious thing, so I couldn't talk to me. But yes, uh, <laughs> Whoever brought that, that was so good. The lemon um, dump cake. That was Alice. Oh, that was Thank good. you, Alice. <laughs> that, because uh, I'm not sure if you meant to say that, Father Alan, you said the Messiah of Isaiah. Yes. And then you also mentioned about Muslims and Jesus. Yes. So if there was a learned rabbi talking about the Messiah based on right. prophecy, right. they have like a different... Different that's understanding. That's a great question. I mean, seem to, and there must be like a different Messiah in the Old Testament. I mean, we talked about people expecting a king and overthrowing the Romans and that mm-hmm. sort of stuff. But I wonder, right? Like, scriptures from different prophets that people were looking. It's just like when right when the wise men came and the Herod said, "Where is the king supposed to be born?" And they said, "Well, according to the scriptures, he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem." So I just wonder if there's some other scriptures that talk about them. Yeah, that's a great question. Is there, are there, uh, is there a different expectation of Messiah that we can back up scripturally? Yes. That is a great question. Um, I think that, that if you cherry pick uh, certain verses, yes. Uh, we hear in Deuteronomy that one like you, Moses, is going to rise for the people. A prophet like you is going to, now, Moses was never crucified. He, he went through some troubles, some trials and tribulations, but he didn't, and he was very meek like Jesus, but he did not suffer the same way. So there's that. Um, Moses, might there's, say, no. Moses might say, Jesus, you only had to do this for three years. I had to suffer with these people for, for 40 years. 40 years. <laughs> well, yeah, Moses, uh, yeah, true. Um, we might also think of King David. Jesus is the fulfillment of King David. And we're reading, as a matter of fact, right now through morning prayer in the Anglican church, you know, in the daily office. We're up to the point, actually, where David, David's had this amazing call on his life and meteoric rise in a way. He was able, as a military man, to defeat Ten thousands, it says. That, that was the song about him. Saul has killed his thousands. David, his ten thousands. And then David, of course, he had to flee into the wilderness because Saul's jealousy. But then he's, reinst- he's instated as the king. And he's very successful. I mean, he's a king, for goodness sakes. David came in riding on a horse. And this is something that's made mention of later. Jesus is not on a horse. What's he on? He's on a donkey. Uh, He's a little uh, less ostentatious, a little less powerful. And so the son of David, you might expect, would be on a horse. Okay, yeah. All right, yeah. So... There are, there are things that would point uh, us in the direction of, of uh, a Messiah, a Messianic king that is exercising great power, that's exercising military prowess, uh, who is commanding armies, because that's what David did. And David, it's very clear in Scripture that this is going to be David's son. 
that the Messiah is going to be David's son. So, yes, I think there are strains within Scripture. It doesn't tell the whole story, obviously. The whole uh, conquering uh, side of the Messiah. But it does tell part of it. And if you're like most people, uh, you tend to focus on the positive expectation and not the negative. And how would you reconcile them together anyway? I mean, that's a difficult thing, isn't it? To expect a king on the one hand, but one who's going to die a shameful death and be despised and rejected and acquainted with grief. That's, it's, it's difficult to wrap your head around until you see it, until you see it happening. And, of course, Jesus shows us. We might remember that fully a third of Mark's gospel is dedicated to the last week of Jesus' life. It's not a mistake. Why a third? <laughs> because it's so important. <laughs> the, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus the um, startling end of Jesus and the surprising but also prophesied uh, resurrection of Jesus. This, these things are startling, and so they, they take time to have us go through them so that we don't get lost, so we understand the scripture that's underneath it, so that we can come to put our trust in this one who loves us so much. Okay, so um, going back uh, to 53 uh, very quickly. Um, in uh, actually uh, 40, excuse me, 52, 13. So shall he startle many nations. Another translation uh is sprinkle many nations. Some of you might have that. Do you have that in um, 52.15? Anybody have startle? Raise your hand. No, nobody has startle. Anybody have sprinkle? Everybody's got sprinkle nowadays. This is from the old, this is the revised standard based on the King James, the authorized version, as uh, the Brits are wont to call it. Uh, and um, uh, he's startling them, or sp- he's sprinkling them, obviously, with his blood. He's startling them. For that which has not been told them, they shall see. And that which they have not heard, they shall understand. That is exactly opposite of what's happening in Isaiah 6, 9. We might remember one of the more difficult passages of Isaiah. Let's turn back there real quick. This is in the revelation of the Messianic king on the throne. Isaiah um, sees the Lord. He falls down as if he were dead. Uh... Uh, Well, he he says, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. And um, uh, that seraphim touched his mouth with a hot burning coal and asks, who shall we send, who shall go for us? And then I said, here I am, send me. And he said, go and say to this people, "Hear hear and hear, but do not understand. See and see, but do not perceive. All right, so there's a hiddenness in the prophetic message that God reveals his truth to certain people. And even though the truth is out there in plain English or plain Hebrew, it, it's not going to be received. But then you turn back to Isaiah 52, 15, this is another moment in, the, in the, the, the work of God among people. That which has not been told them, they shall see. And that which they have not heard, they shall understand. 
So the people were seeing things and not understanding and hearing things and not understanding. And over here you have people who are not seeing uh, and not hearing, but yet they are given the knowledge. And I think that is about the opening up of God's graciousness and his love to a, a whole new group of people. Uh, raise your hand if you are a Gentile. Yes. With, uh, yes, yeah. Most of us in this room, we're Gentiles. And uh, God, he, he opened up uh, the truth to his chosen people. Not, and some people would get it. There was always a remnant that understood. Uh, we see this in Elijah, right? There are how many people who did not bow their knee to Baal? How many people? Anybody remember? Baal being the foreign god. It was like 7,000, I think. There was a remnant of people who were faithful and who wouldn't participate in idolatrous worship. And uh, God uh, always has kept a group of people believing. Think about the people who came with Jesus and believed. Eleven of the disciples of the apostles believed, obviously, at least eleven. Maybe Judas believed too, but was just so stung with remorse that he killed himself. It's hard to know exactly, although Jesus says, yeah, no, he, he's, he's lost. But anyway, that's a little uh, aside there. Um, so uh, in verse 4, 53, 4, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And um, the thing that's so new uh, the thing that's wild and crazy is that there's vicarious suffering for community. What's vicarious mean? That's a nice big Latin word. Living through another. Okay, it's for another. I think just whatever it is for another, for the sake of another. Uh, is somebody who's a vicar, uh, like uh, Maggie's dad uh, was a vicar, uh, he stood in place of the bishop in that local church. Uh, so vicarious means uh, standing in for another. It could be serving for another in the place of another. Uh, you think of an ambassador, for instance, right, who has the ability to stand in for the, the country. Um, and in Jesus' work for us, he is, he is suffering for another in the place of another. He is counted among the transgressors. He is made to be sin who knew no sin. He was uh, accounted as uh, uh, yeah, somebody who who hated God in some way, even though he loved God. He loved his father. He was counted in a different direction. So surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. And you could see uh, why you think he was smitten by God. I mean, well... There's that scripture, I think it's in Numbers or Deuteronomy. Cursed is every person who is held up on a tree. Uh, if somebody was hung up on a tree through crucifixion or some other way, there was a special curse in the Jewish understanding. Well, we thought he was cursed by God. But it says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He wasn't cursed because he was bad. He suffered because of us. He suffered because of us. Uh, it gets very specific here in verse 7. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. You think about Jesus on the road to Cal uh, Calvary. Um, he is, he's very quiet. He doesn't berate people. 
He's not, he's not uh, protesting. He's not trying to, to justify himself. He's like a lamb who's going to slaughter. Lambs are very <laughs> patient animals, and they will just go. He didn't defend himself. He didn't he defend. Trials. That's right. He did not. He did not. He answered a few questions in a kind of, in a way that didn't help himself, but he did not. And we know how smart he is. Do you remember when he was up on the Temple Mount and they said, Teacher, we know that you don't care about what people think uh, because you, you know, you're above that. But can you tell us, uh, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? Do you remember that? That question, that trap that they put him in? And what if he had said, yeah, sure, go pay it. What, what is he doing? He's saying, you should give to a guy who calls himself God. Because Caesar, actually on the coins it says, son of God. <laughs> okay. And then, but if he said no, what, how would they get him? They would accuse him of rebelling, of rebelling against Rome. There were some of both parties there, ready to hammer him whichever way he went. And what did he say? He said, show me the coin. And so one of them was like, okay. Pulls out the coin. He said, whose image and likeness is on that? And they said, Caesar's. He said, give that thing that belongs to Caesar to Caesar, but you give to God what belongs to God. Whose image and likeness are you made in? God. Yeah, what's, actually, you're the coin that goes to God. The money, give it to Caesar. Hmm. But you, give yourself to God. He's very brilliant. He could have talked his way out. Remember, they were about to kill him in Luke chapter 4 when it's his first sermon... <laughs> And he says, behold, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. I've come, uh, I've been anointed uh, to proclaim good news to the prisoner and the release of the captive and the opening of eyes uh, for those who are blind. So this is his first sermon. I remember my first sermon. I remember how scared I was. I was shaking. My knees were like, they were like this the whole time. Thank God there was this really th big pulpit I was behind so that I could... I could be kind of still up here like this. I mean, I literally, this is how I was. Did they take you and try to throw you off the mountain? No, they did not. I did not say anything nearly so controversial <laughs> as what Jesus did. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is when they did try to throw him off the mountain, what did he do? He just walked through their midst. He had the power to defend himself. He had the power to say, not now. I'm just going to go my own way. I mean, he's, he had all the power in his hands. He said, I could call down 12 legions of angels and uh, they'd defend me. But here, like a lamb led to the slaughter. This describes him. Like a lamb led to the slaughter. Like a sheep that before its shearers is dumb, he opened not his mouth. And by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And we know that he was judged several times. He was judged uh, by, by the, uh, the high priests. And he was sent in front of uh, Herod. And, uh, and he was sent in front of the Roman governor. He was just judged all over the place. By judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who has considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living and stricken for the transgression of my people. Again, it was for for uh, us, for the people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. And we actually know the name of the rich man that, that gave his grave to him. What was his name? Joseph. Joseph of Arimathea. I mean, it's amazing how many details are fulfilled between here in Isaiah and then in the gospel narratives, in the passion narratives. Who do you think the wicked they're referring to, too? The two thieves? I think so. I think those were the thieves, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, he died along with them. And then, of course, he found that he, he was given a rich man's tomb. Uh, and, um, yeah, okay. So that's Isaiah 52 and 53. Um, anything come to your mind as you're seeing, as you're reading it? This is the first time that I've read it where I realize that God is so loving to make it plain through his scripture to the Jewish people to give them a chance right. to know the truth. Right, yeah. He's so loving to tell them mm -hmm. that forewarning of what's yeah. going to happen. He is loving, uh, and he wants, <laughs> he's very, it's clear. He wills that no man be lost, but that all be saved. Jew and Gentile. That's good. Uh, other things. Um, um, are you going to help me? Or shall I speak? Oh, you want to close it? Yeah, yeah, he can cl Yeah, he wants to close it, I think. But I mean, you might want to help him because uh, it might be tough with that. Oh, you're doing a good job, man. Good job. The man that spoke on Sunday, he yeah. was talking about... Deacon I, Tim. Yeah. Yeah. He was talking about how God kind of, and it said in Scripture that God grafted us in, the Gentiles, in order to make the Jews jealous mm -hmm. so that they would... See, he just keeps... He keeps wanting them to see it mm -hmm. and to take him and accept him. Right. Right. It's like he keeps trying. He he's forever trying for them. Isn't he it? does. He does. He's and and he makes he's made promises mm -hmm. to the Jews. He still loves them. Uh, we're going to see that a little bit later in some of these passages. Yeah, that's good. Uh, anybody else? Any insights on Isaiah fifty-two or fifty-three? Okay. Um, the assignment was to read 54 all the way to the end uh, of Isaiah. A lot of chapters. Um, what do you? What did you notice? Is there anything that? Um, uh, anything that you noticed in in all? Did you notice how many? Songs and canticles come from here. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you look at uh, Isaiah 55, um, 55, 6 and following, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. This is one of the canticles of the church, and it goes all the way, all the way down, uh, I think, uh, through verse 11. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven, return not thither but water the earth, so shall be my word that goes from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty. That's one of the great canticles of the church. There's uh, 12 there. That's one of the songs we sing. And the mountains and the hills will break forth and shouts of joy. And the trees of the field will clap, clap their hands. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. there's, um, it would be interesting sometime. I'm sure somebody's done that. <clears throat> all of the different, well, different Bible verses in Isaiah that are mm -hmm. songs. Yeah, a lot of them have been made into songs. You go to verse, uh, um, chapter 60. Arise, shine, your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. That's that's a canticle of the church. Surge illuminare in Latin. Yeah. Um, a lot of mountains and hills. Yeah, yeah, a lot of mountains and hills. Yes. They're both leveling them, they're shouting, we're heading toward them. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, the uh, the leveling of the hills. Um, it's in here somewhere. Let, let's, let me see where it is. Um, you look at uh, 5714. 5714. And it shall be said, build up, build up, prepare the way. Remove every obstruction from my people's way. Uh, and uh, that, of course, you can go back to 40. 
Isaiah 40. Um, and 43, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. What's the way of the Lord and why did there need to be preparation? Is it the way that the Lord walks on or is it the way that we walk on to the Lord? What do you think? I noticed that too, that, that you know, it's like shout, announce. You know, there, there, is, there is that desire to say it before it happens. And so I was just right. thinking of speaking. That's what Lisa Marie is saying. For, there's, he's telling it ahead of time mm-hmm. to the Jewish people. Right. Mm-hmm. Announce it. It's like he can't contain it because mm-hmm. there's so much joy and goodness coming. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there's a preparation, mental preparation, spiritual preparation. Um, how many of you have ever heard of a city of refuge? Has anybody ever heard of a city of refuge? Uh, can run to. This is, that's right. This is where you would run to. Uh, think about all of Israel like um, a whole nation that's playing tag, okay? And there are six safe cities. And those cities are places if, if you're cutting wood with your friend and the, the ax head flies off the handle, hits him in the head and kills him, well, in the, the law, it's, you know, it's an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. So it's a head for a head, okay? Life for life. But if it was a mistake, that's manslaughter. So what you would do is you would, you would, you would not talk to anybody else. You wouldn't tell anybody what happened. You wouldn't go to his family and say, I'm sorry. Why not? Because they might kill you on the spot. What you would do is you would start running. You would run to the city of refuge. Put no stumbling block. There were, there were laws concerning this. You could not have uh, like an obstacle course on the way to the city of refuge. Why? Because if they got slowed down, then maybe the guy who is in pursuit could catch him and kill him. And you think about putting a stumbling block in front of people. Putting a stumbling block making them trip before they get to the city of refuge, Mm. that safe place where we know we can live. Jesus is likened Mm. to a city of refuge, Mm. that safe place that we run to so that when we sin or when we make a mistake or we hurt somebody, what do we do? We run to Jesus we run to him uh, and we stay with him. <laughs> By the way, if they left the city of refuge, they were fair game. Somebody might have been waiting outside <laughs> with a, a, a club or a sword or something like that. So. I suppose that's sort of where it came from in, in years past with churches. As refuges? Church, as a refuge. I think so. I think so. You think about that churches were considered sanctuaries until, who was it? Uh, Thomas a Becket, I think, was uh, ran into a cathedral of Canterbury, and the king said, you must come out. And Thomas a Becket said, I will not come out. And the king said, you must come out. And he said, I will not come out. And so they sent some people in after him and killed him there in the cathedral. And that became the place of his martyrdom, actually becomes Canterbury Cathedral. And uh, one of the the great shrines in the English church where somebody had run to the city of refuge, it wasn't respected, or that place of refuge, and it wasn't respected. And everybody thought that was just the most terrible thing that had ever happened, that the king wouldn't respect that sanctuary. So... uh, and then there's um, in 62:10 again, um, we see, go through, go through the gates, 
Prepare the way for the people. Build up. Build up the highway. Clear it of stones. Build up the highway. Um, you go through uh, Israel today, it's very hilly. Uh, the easiest thing, of course, to walk on is on a straight and level path. And so, uh, in some places it says, every valley shall be lifted up and every high and lofty hill shall be brought down to make it easy so that we can go to the Lord. St. Paul says, I put no stumbling block in anyone's way. I'm not trying to trip you up. I want you to go to the Lord. I want to make it easy for you. John the Baptist, Mm -hmm. a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare it in your hearts. And actually, I think that's (laughs) that's where the road is more than anywhere else. It's right here. It's a preparation right here so that you could receive the truth right in the heart. There's a great song by a hard rock band from the 1980s, a Christian rock band. Imagine that. In the 80s, that was a novel thing. It was called Petra. Anybody ever hear of Petra? Mm -hmm. And they had a song, a really good song called The Road to Zion. The Road to Zion's in your heart. It's a beautiful, it's a really beautiful ballad that they do. And they do some good uh, hard rock stuff too. But uh, Road to Zion in your heart. So, all right, so we notice the, the, the road image. What else do we notice in these passages? Uh, the last four, uh, 13 or 14 chapters of Isaiah. In 63.9, I have um, notes that yeah. say God's involvement with those in pain, which yeah. would definitely yes. correlate back to when Jesus was oh, that's good. in grief, you know, yeah. when he was paying the debt. Yeah, would you read that passage to yeah, us? Yeah, it's 63.9. In all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his mercy, he redeemed them. And he lifted them and carried them all the days of old. Yeah. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. Mm-hmm. So much mm. mercy and mm. love. If, um, uh, if I could uh, make an analogy. Uh, if my friend Greg here is hurt by somebody. Mm. That hurts me. Why? Because I love this guy. Um, And we know this with our families. When our families hurt, we hurt. Uh, God makes the human kind, his family, in his son Jesus. There's great compassion. So, yeah, okay, that was great. What else do you notice? The first part of 59 has got some really killer stuff in there. It's pretty, pretty gory. Okay. Like adder's eggs and spider's webs and stuff. Yeah, but sounds when, like a haunted house. Yeah, really. Fifty nine, early when I, on. When I got to the end of it, verses twelve and thirteen, I was I was almost certain that was like identical to something I re- uh, something in Psalm fifty one. Not identical, but it really reminded me of Psalm fifty one. Yeah, our transgressions are multiplied before they are sins testify against us. Sure, right. Mhm. Yeah. Um so yeah, there's a this is it's it it feels different um uh, chapter 59 I think um than some of the other chapters in 60 you've got arise and shine for your light has come. Yeah. Um and uh in 57 
We've got build up, build up, prepare the way, remove every obstruction from my people's way. So there are these positive things. I think 58 and 59 is, a, is going back for a moment into that indictment uh, type of language, the legal language that's saying, hey, this is what I've got against you. This is what I've got against you. You have got to uh, do better and you've got to repent. Um, in Isaiah 58, verse 6, about the fast that he chooses. <clears throat> and uh, um, listen to this in 58, 7. Is, is it not, is not, it, it is the, the fast not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house? And when you see the naked, to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up. You think about this for a second. In 58.6, is not this the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of wickedness? Jesus loosed the bonds of wickedness, did he? Did he not? He, he helped people get set free from their sin, uh, both on the cross, but also by just encouraging them and healing them. And let's think about the, the woman caught in adultery. He has loosed the bonds of wickedness for her. Or you think of um, the man who was lowered through the roof. Remember that man who was lowered through the roof? And what does Jesus say to him? He says, my son, your sins are, sins are forgiven. He's, loosed, he's loosing a bond uh, uh, of wickedness. And then to let the oppressed go free. And there are times when Jesus just answers this perfectly. People who are oppressed by demons, people who are possessed by demons, they are freed. You remember that man who was... Um, he was possessed by a legion of demons on the seashore. And Jesus lets him go free. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? Well, Jesus shared his, his own body with the hungry, right? Take, eat, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. I am the bread of life. To bring the homeless poor into your house. Jesus, the carpenter, he's, uh, he's working on a mansion for us. And uh, he's inviting us into his father's house. When you see the naked to cover him, what does Jesus cover us with? What does he cover us with? Forgiveness. Forgiveness, yes, definitely. His blood. His blood, yes. He covers us also with his own righteousness. He covers us with his righteousness. And uh, of course, uh, not, it says in verse 7, not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Jesus, son of David, doesn't hide himself from his own flesh. Jesus, the second Adam, does not hide himself from all the other children of Adam and Eve. What else do you see? Well, there's a couple spots. There's 54, and I know I saw it somewhere else where the future, you know, New Jerusalem, um, the language sort of uh, metaphorically like a marriage. Yeah. Marriage. Oh, that's really good. The room and the garments and the jewels. Right, right, right. It's in 54, and I know it's in there later, too. Yeah, it is. It's really pretty. It is. Well, 61, end of 61, there's sort of priestly wedding garments and stuff, mm -hmm. but it's in there quite a bit. Right, and it's earlier on in Isaiah as well. 
I know, it's earlier on. I'm not exactly sure where. Why? Why so much? 62. Why so much stuff about weddings? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Why so much? The testament, the church, the church, Christ is the bridegroom, and the church. Mm -hmm. Christ is the bridegroom. That's great. That's it. Christ is the bridegroom. The church is. Our sins were made white as snow. That's right. By the work he did. That's right. Like our, he's our sin. It here. Mm -hmm. And white is what the bride wears. That's right. That's right. Have you all seen that banner that's hanging uh, behind the cross uh, over there? Let's take a let's take a short <laughs> jaunt. Okay, I'll pause this. It'd be good for us to stretch our legs. Okay, so after that field trip, we're at Isaiah fifty-seven fifteen. We've looked at the the dwelling of God is with man in Revelation. Listen to this in um, 57, 15. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. We would expect that of God, right? He dwells in the high and holy place. But also with him who is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite. Mm -hmm. What does contrite mean? What does that mean? Sorry. Sorry for your sins. Yeah, sorry. Uh, literally, the word means crushed. That's a, it's a nice Latin word for crushed, pulverized, uh, made into dust. The contrite one is the one who is just, he's not proud, he is just dust before the Lord. She is not proud. She's not holding her head up high and saying, I did it my way. But instead saying, oh God, I have messed up. Uh, and God promises that he will live with not only with the, the, in the high and holy place, but also with the one who's humble. Isn't that encouraging? Very encouraging. Because if he didn't live with a humble, he's not going to live with a proud. And if he didn't live with a humble, then he wouldn't live with anybody. But thank God he puts in our hearts the desire to be with him, to, um, to make a change. Those of us who are addicts, uh, we say, uh, we know uh, uh, step one, I think it is, uh, uh, we cannot control what's going on with our addiction. I think all Christians should be able to say that. Uh, I'm not saying step one perfectly. I wish I had a book here with me. But um, uh, it, 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 it basically says... Uh, uh, I cannot, uh, 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 my, my, my addiction's unmanageable. Am I getting that right? Mm -hmm. so it's something like that. Okay. So, um, Shelly, you're looking it up? Yeah. Um, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives have become unmanageable. Okay, so there's a powerlessness. If you t take away the word alcohol and you put sin in there, sin. I think every Christian should be here. <laughs> and it's step one. Mm -hmm. We can't stop sinning, Lord. Mm -hmm. It's going to be, if it's not alcohol, it's something else. Let's just be real. Let's be real with each other. Let's be honest with each other. But that's, that, that coming to the place of admission is being pulverized. <laughs> Being, becoming contrite and saying, I just can't do it, Lord. Uh, it's beyond me. I'm dust. I'm dust. But God says, that's great because I want to live with you. You're the kind of person I want. <laughs> I, I love it when people uh, are penitent, God says. He who is well has no need of a physician. Yes, he who is well has no need of a physician. I came not to call the righteous 
but the unrighteous. He who is well has no need of a physician. You don't need a doctor if you're not sick. I'm the doctor. I'm the doctor of souls. If you're not sick, fine. Oh, just go on. Go on with your life. You're fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead, Olga. Is there really a person who never sinned? No. Except for Jesus. Except for Jesus. Everyone is in need of Jesus. Yes. Everyone. That's the, that's the secret that's, that Christians are trying to get out there and tell everybody in the world about Jesus. And, you know, I, I know sometimes people say, well, don't impose your religion on me. Don't, uh, don't try to guilt trip me into anything. Look, I, I wasn't imposed upon and I wasn't guilt tripped into Christianity. But when... When I came close to Jesus, I saw my sin and my need of him. And everybody sins. Everybody. Well, and the closer you get, the more clearly you see it. Yes, the closer you get, the more clearly you see it. And maybe the older you get. Either, either the older you get, the more clearly you see it, or the more you are good at hiding it from yourself. Those are the two options, right? <laughs> And there are some people who are really good at hiding it from themselves, unfortunately. Yeah. That's the other option. So, yeah, the Lord, uh, he has this beautiful, beautiful invitation. I Can dwell. I read a little verse? Please do, Lisa Marie. It's, read the verse. It's from Isaiah 55, and it's, it's part of it. Um, and you who have no money, it's the very first. Yes. Verse. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. And doesn't that just like sum it up? Because Jesus requires no payment. His sacrifice is sufficient for all. That's good. You know? That's really good. Yeah, we'll end with that. Um, no payment necessary. Jesus pays it all. Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. Uh, how does it finish? How does it? All to him I owe. Sin had made a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. White as snow. Amen.